aunts and grandmothers who are not saved. And, and it's our opportunity today to visit them and minister to them and share the gospel with them. Take every opportunity. Take every opportunity to do so. Uh, but nonetheless, like Brother Roy said, none of us would be here had not been for moms. It would have just been Adam. And that would have been kind of boring. So, uh, but praise the Lord for moms. And um, thanks for all that you do. Thanks for all that you do. And what a blessing it is to have a mom. If uh, uh, some of us, our moms have passed away, and they're with the Lord. And uh, that's an awesome thing to know that one day you will see them again. And you will hold their hand just like you used to do. So praise the Lord for that. And we want to pray for each individual mom because the scripture talks about um, also the fact that we're to treat older women like mothers in the scriptures in Timothy and uh, younger women like sisters, right? So it's a whole family here, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the way God prescribed it. That's the way God wanted it. And so we're to do that, treat older women as mothers. So some, there's a lot of mothers here. <laughs> and uh, younger, younger women like sisters, a lot of sisters here. Praise the Lord. And we have moms, and we have moms in the faith. And so um, I've met some moms that never had biological children, but had tons and tons of kids uh, in the faith. They discipled them. They grew them up in the faith. They were incredibly encouragement to them. And they, many women looked up to them as women, uh, as mothers in the faith. So uh, some of you guys are like that and encourage you to be that and do that. Um, go beyond your biological children and disciple younger women to be good moms and to be godly wives. That's what the scripture tells us to do. So I encourage you to do that as well. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for moms. Thank you, Lord, that in your plan for humanity, you made them out to be husband, wife, moms, dads. And thank you, Lord, that in that relationship, it reflects the unity of God, the unity of our Lord, that we can have two people becoming one in marriage, and we can have uh, someone, a, a human being, come out of some, another human being, and a miracle that we see, Lord, in life is that uh, Lord, you can give life from another life. Uh, and thank you for moms that they uh, endured, Lord, being moms, not only the physical labor, but also, Lord, the spiritual labor to be moms, godly moms, to pray. And thank you, Lord, that many, many are here saved because of the prayers of moms, because of the prayers of grandmothers. And we thank you for them, Lord. May you bless them. May you encourage them. May you give them, uh, Lord, strength in many years to come not just because of the years that they have advanced in, Lord God, but give them more so that they would continue to walk with you, Lord. We need them. And so, Lord, would you keep them in, pre in, in, in their precious faith. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Yeah. Amen. God bless you guys. John Wesley, one of the most wonderful preachers that this world uh, has ever seen out of England, but one of the most amazing preachers, uh, of all the things he learned, of all the things he knew and understood from the Bible, he said his mother had the most influence. Susanna Wesley was one of the most godliest women he ever knew. And John Wesley was a very godly man, so I could imagine how godly she was. And um, his, not only his continued walk with the Lord was due to her uh, commitment, prayer, but also encouraging him to become more godly. So... Happy Mother's Day, and thanks for all that you do. You can change someone's life and become one of the greatest preachers that ever lived, and he changed a lot of lives. So just through one mom, just through one mom. So let's turn to the book of Philippians, please. The book of Philippians, chapter 1. The title of our message today, Facing Trials, Disappointments, and Uncertainties. It's a long title. Facing Trials, Disappointments, and uncertainties, looking at Paul's example, looking at Paul's example. Of all that Paul's going to talk about here today, these are the three things that he dealt with. And how did he deal with them? Because you look at all those three things that I just talked about, trials, disappointments, and uncertainties. Today, we all have them. We all have them. Um, and hopefully we could be honest with ourselves and say, yes, Lord, I'm facing a trial or maybe coming out of a trial. Lord, I have a lot of disappointments, or I'm dealing with a lot of disappointments, and I'm facing a lot of uncertainties. What can I learn from this text through Paul's example that can help me 
to walk with you closer. Because ultimately, that's what it is. It's, the answer is not in some necessarily a book or some kind of uh, experience you're going to have. Uh, the answer is in the Lord. The answer is in how we see Jesus in that particular situation that we face. So let's read verse 12. We read up to verse 11 last week. Paul says, now I want you to know, brethren, he's speaking to the Philippians, the elders and the believers there, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Now, very important, we're going to deal with that verse, the Praetorian Guard, who they were, and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So to be sure, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strife, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. But the former, those who envy and those who strive, uh, they do it out of selfish ambition. They proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress, or another translation would say irritation, in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense, that means falseness, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Through your prayers and provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ shall be even known as always be exalted in my body, whether I live or whether I die. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's one of the most amazing scriptures you'll ever read in the whole New Testament, and we'll talk about that in detail. But if I am to live on the, in this body, then it will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which one I want to choose. For I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to leave, to depart, and die and be with Christ, for that is much, much better. Literally, in the Greek, it's very much better or much, much better. Yet to remain in this body, it's more necessary for you. I am convinced of this. I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress, uh, and progress and joy in the faith, so that your profound confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Lord God, take the pages of this book and what we just read. Lord, they're in ink, but Lord, they are life and they are spirit. So please... Put them in our hearts, in our minds. Help us to be open, Lord, to the glory and the meaning of those words, that they are inspired by the Holy Spirit through the hands of Paul, through the mind of Paul, to bring us an understanding of who Jesus is and how he is working in our lives. Lord God, help us, Lord, not to deceive ourselves into thinking that uh, this, is, uh, this is something that, uh, in my trials and circumstances, this is something that... Uh, uh, it can't be overcome, or I, I brought this upon myself, Lord, but to also to think that you are sovereignly in control of these things that are happening in my life, and to trust you in it, Lord, and to see Christ Jesus in those circumstances and how to bring about his glory. So this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in the book of Philippians, about 60 to 61 AD, this beautiful area across the agency, across Troas, and we talked about how Paul got there through a dream. It was a vision, a dream of a Macedonian man telling Paul, come over and help us. He didn't know how far he could go. He thought the Lord had him preach in Galatia, and the Bible says he closed every door. Every door was closed by God. God was not letting him through to preach there. Finally got to Troas, across the agency, into Philippi, this beautiful colony. It was a Roman colony, we're told. And, of course, Paul experienced time in jail there. He experienced uh, times of beatings and times of persecution. And that's how the church started, through beatings and persecution. How about a church that starts like that? Well, yeah. it's not, that doesn't happen here in America much, if any. Yeah. 
but it happens everywhere else. A beautiful church that came out of tears, suffering, and prayer. Uh, a woman being saved by the riverside, Lydia. A girl, demonically possessed, but by the Spirit of Christ, was able to, uh, the demon was released out of her life, out of her body. And a Philippian jailer who was suicidal. That's not the kind of people you would start a church, wouldn't it? You know, a businesswoman, a demon-possessed girl, and a suicidal jailer. Nobody, I don't think I would ever read a book about church growth that will tell you this is how you start a church. But God has a different plan in a different place, in a different, totally different thinking. He wants to bring people to himself and save them out of the most amazing, most terrorizing places and bring them to a family. And they became a family. Paul spent time in the household of Lydia with the Philippian jailer, with the girl that was demonically possessed. But he goes back to Rome, and on his, on his missionary journey, he goes back to Rome, and he's in prison. And we're going to talk about his imprisonment, because this letter was written from prison, and it's sort of a two kind of different ways. It was a house arrest, which was he was in Rome in house arrest, but then as he's waiting for trial, he's waiting this trial that is going to be before Caesar, Nero, He's waiting for this trial. He is moved from a house arrest environment to a actual prison, an actual jail, which we're not very fond, uh, uh, well, not very fond of, but not very fun to be in there either. And so Paul is in jail, and he's talking about his circumstances and his thoughts and desires. And this is one of the, uh, if you ever wanted to know Paul's heart, uh, Paul in many circles and churches gets a bad rap in many different ways. I even had people in this church tell me, I thought Paul was this chauvinistic woman, you know, kind of against women. And um, then I read some of the things you said, and wow, he's not anything like that. And I said, how did you get that? And I said, well, I went to this whatever church, and I read this book, and Paul was this mean guy that was against everybody. And theologically, Paul is amazing. I mean, most of the New Testament is written by him. But this letter shows you beyond the theological aspect of it, the heart of the person. What moved Paul? What was his desire? What made him continue in the faith and continue to preach? What motivated him and what did he care about the most? And this 12 through 26 will show you, probably more than any other letter except maybe 2 Timothy toward the end of his life, what actually motivated Paul how did he deal with trials, how he dealt with circumstances that were against him, disappointments, very. Trials, many. And uncertainties, you're going to face them today. So he's talking about this, this trial and this persecution. Remember, uh, Paul suffered tremendous for the Lord. He suffered prison in many, many different places. Uh, it, it was a joke, but it was not, not that funny, that before Paul went into a town, uh, he would check out the local jails just to see how the, you know, the place was going to look like when he came in. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of the case it was. But suffering, suffering and trials. We think, and this is as, as, as a Christian church in America, we think suffering, terrible. What did we do wrong? Why me? Right? We look at suffering that way, right? Why me? Why does God disturb my beautiful, peaceful life and have these, bring this trial in my life? And we suffer. We suffer that. And it's normal human experience, right? We Christians suffer normal human experience like injustice and illness and financial troubles and hunger and disappointments. But Christians go beyond that, right? We suffer like everybody else suffers, the normal sufferings of life. But then we suffer other things like persecution for our faith. Uh, the, the suffering of seeing other believers not going on in their faith, our children not following the Lord. These are things that the unbelievers will never understand, never understood what that means, never understand what that means. But Paul did, and look at verse 12. He begins to tell them something very important. This is, he begins to open his heart. After the introduction, this is the first part of the letter. I want you to know, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, what circumstances? that he's in prison. He is now not in house arrest. He's been moved, waiting trial in a very terrible place in jail. Roman jails were like dungeons, very dark, very dingy. Some of them were used as sewers. So you could imagine uh, being in sewage and writing about rejoice in the Lord. Yep. 
you know, um, the internet goes down here and uh, everybody begins to have trials, you know, uh, <laughs> quite different than what Paul dealt with, right? The trials here is much worse and much more difficult. I want you to know, I want you to understand, I want you to know how to pray accurately for my situation. These are my real needs. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, remember Paul suffered. The Philippians knew that. He had been stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. He had been betrayed by Christians, betrayed by Jews. He had been beaten 40, uh, 40 times, times minus one. Uh, he had suffered the loss of many things, and yet he continued to move forward in the gospel, and the Philippians were there with them side by side. So about 11 years after his visit to Philippi, this is when the letter is written. So 11 years have transpired from the day that Paul entered Philippi with Lydia, the Philippian jailer, and the, the woman who, the lady, the young lady, who a demon was cast out of her. 11 years have passed, and they have seen Paul be shipwrecked, stoned, uh, left for dead, and now in prison. And he begins to tell them, I want you to know about my current condition, that my circumstances, which I'm in today, have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. You're not going to hear Paul moan and complain about how terrible life has been in difficulty and the difficult trials that he's faced. Isn't, I mean, reading this can victim, just reading on a surface level. Where's the complaint? Yeah. Where's the woe is me? You know, pobrecito. Where's, where's, the, where's that complaining? You know? um, it's nothing like that. You know, it, it, it's... it's um, he begins to talk about the circumstances that he's facing, and they have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. This is a model prayer, a model example of how to deal with trials, right? He has heard from Epaphroditus. Later, we're going to find out Epaphroditus was once sent by the, Philippi, by the Philippi's to come to minister to him, but he was sick. He became so sick, he went back to Philippi, and he sends a letter with Epaphroditus to be read to all the church. So this is how the letter got into their hands. Epaphroditus was a servant, came to minister to Paul, became very ill, almost died. He was sent back home to Philippi and then delivers the letter. Epaphroditus had shared with Paul the fact that they were concerned that, they, that Paul was in jail, that Paul was going to suffer, that he was becoming sick and he was despondent and he didn't want to go on. And he begins to tell them, this is what I'm going through right now. I want you to know the reality so you can pray better. Is that important to know? When you want to pray for somebody, you want to know, you want to hear from them. What is your circumstance? What is on your heart? And this is what he says. I don't want you to worry about me. I'm facing death. I'm facing a soon-to-be trial. Um, but don't worry about me in that part. Uh, I'm ready to be with Jesus, he's going to tell us later on. I'm ready to be with Jesus. Um, it's not what they're expecting. <laughs> you know, they were probably expecting Paul to write to them how miserable he was and how he longed for the Lord to get him out of this. Get him out of this trial. Amen if you have ever prayed, Lord, get me out of this trial. Amen. And many times, okay, good. Because um, that's their first inkling. Get me out of this. What did I do? Why am I going through this? And Paul has a totally different perspective that will help us understand trials. Um, we're told that Paul, reading the last part of the book of Acts, so this is about Acts chapter 20, 21, 22, he had, been, um, he had been sent to Jerusalem. He had been apprehended at Jerusalem. He was almost torn to pieces by the religious Jews at the time. He was saved by a Roman guard, took him out of that area, put him in, a, put him in prison to save them out of the mob. He was charged... Uh, um, he was charged, uh, false, falsely accused. He was, there was a plot to kill him. He was in prison for two years. There was two hearings. Remember King Agrippa and Felix and all that? Okay, this is what he went through. Left in prison, sent to Rome, sent on a ship. The ship shipwrecked, almost died, and now finally, finally gets to Rome. Finally gets to Rome. This little Jewish guy, uh, after suffering so much, goes on the Apian way. Yeah, the serpent and, and, and the preaching at, uh, um, at Malta. But he goes to, Ap you know, you go to Italy today, you go to Rome, and there's the, 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 the remains of the Apian way, the, the, the way of Rome. The, there was a road that led to the center of Rome, still there. 
going back to the first century, they'll tell you, this is the first century road that many people took. And as a Christian, you get excited because this is what Paul would have walked on. The bricks are still there. The tiles are still there where Paul would have walked up this road in chains, chained to a prison guard, to a, a soldier coming up to face Caesar, but coming up to face Caesar with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rome was going to hear the gospel. And it's quite interesting. What was Paul's desire in his letters? What was his one desire that he wanted to go where? He wanted to go to Rome to preach the gospel. That was his desire. You read it in the letters. He desired to go to Rome to preach. Well, God had a way of getting him there. <laughs> Not the way he expected. right? Not the way he they thought he was just going to walk into Rome. Never did he think it would be in chains after all that he suffered, but he got there. And this is the thing about trials. Trials will get us where the Lord wants us to get us to, but maybe not the way you thought it would be. Maybe not the way you ever imagined it to be. You know, Lord, I want to preach to my family. Preach to, you know, that, is that your heart desire? I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming. I want to share the gospel with my family. Well, it may be on a bed. It may be on a gurney when you have to tell them about Jesus. Yeah. Lord, I never thought it would be like that. Yeah. Well, it might be. I don't know. It may be somebody else's gurney. It may be somebody else's health condition. It may be, God forbid, at a funeral where you would have to share the gospel. Lord, I never intended for that to happen. The Lord is the Lord, and he will put you where he wants us to minister. But maybe in a way you never expected. Paul didn't expect this to happen. Neither the Philippians. Lord, get Paul out of prison quickly. Paul's going to tell him, look, I'm here in Rome. And he's writing from Rome now, from this prison cell. And he says, I want you to think about this. Two things, the past and the future. I'm not worried about the past, all right? The things that have happened to me, my circumstances, have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. What let me hear, it's not a problem. Amazing. People sometimes can't deal with their past. That's what they can never move forward with the Lord because they're so stuck in what happened. They're so stuck in what happened three years ago, four years ago. They hurt me, whatever. And they still dwell on that, and they never move forward in the Lord. Why? Because they believed the circumstances should not have been that way. Oh, how terrible it was. Paul could have lamented. And I just gave you really quick what happened to him over an 11-year period. I mean, 11 years of being stuck in trials and hardships? Man. Well, he says, I want you to know that what happened to me, it actually has worked out for good. It actually has worked out for the better. Because through these circumstances, I actually seen the gospel progress. It's gotten bigger. It's gotten more, right? Yeah, can you imagine that through, if the Lord told you, you know, I'm going to put you through a lot of trials. But through your trials, the gospel is going to come out of your home or of your mouth or of your church or whatever. And it's going to be for the betterment, not of you, but of the gospel. How many of you would take that? I, in a very difficult environment where we're in today, we would go, huh, but what about me? Well, you'll be fine, but the gospel will be better. The gospel will be greater in a greater capacity, a greater effect. Well, that's what happened to Paul. Him, he suffered. The gospel got greater. Why? For the betterment of the gospel, Paul endured this. Now, let's continue. The second thing is, and we're going to read it in verse 20, is he's not worried about the future. The uncertainties are not going to concern him. We're going to read that in verse 20 and 21. The future, he's not so concerned about the future, right? So it is uncertain to many things. He didn't know. Paul didn't even know if he was going to make it out of the trial alive. They could have killed him before even the trial. But this is what he's facing. So what happened in the past has turned out to be for the better. Look at verse 13. What has it turned out for the better? So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known through the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. The gospel is now being planted in Rome. I always wanted to go to Rome, Paul would say, and preach the gospel. I didn't think it would be like this. But the destination was Rome. And that's why Paul could rejoice in this, right? Because God was working it out. Paul is now awaiting trial in this smelly dungeon. And he's thinking... 
man, I never could have reached the Praetorian Guard unless I was in prison. You know there's people in your life that you would never be able to reach with the gospel unless God put you through a trial? Wow. Is it worth it? You better believe it. And this is where, this is dealing with trials, dealing with disappointments, and dealing with difficulties, and dealing with uncertainties. This is where we have to get out of ourselves and just go, what is it that Christ is doing here? What is it that the Lord is doing in my life? Because if I start thinking, like, woe is me, and I can't believe I'm in this mess, and uh, what's going to happen in the future, then I'm really going to be despondent. And Paul wasn't about to be in this moment. He's not thinking happy thoughts, just to think of happy thoughts and make him feel better. He really believes this is for the betterment of the gospel. And it happened. Who were this Praetorian Guard? There were the elite forces of Rome. 9,000 of them served uh, in this, this elite force. Right? Think of the Green Berets. Think of uh, Delta Force. Think of something like that with the Marines. Think of Navy SEALs. This is what it was like for them. The Romans had 9,000 of them. They served 1,000 at a time, and they cycled, right? They served them once, once, uh, uh, nine, in nine cycles, 1,000 Praetorian guards at Caesar's household or the, 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 the palace. Every time you went to the palace, there would be 1,000 of these guys there, special forces, elite. They picked out the best of the best, so elite that uh, they got double pay double pay, and they had a pension. None of them did have pensions except for then. And they lived in the palace guard. They were the really bad guys. <laughs> they were the guys that you said, you need something done, they would get it done. Right? Think of you know, Navy SEALs like that. Think of Delta Force. Think of somebody like that. Um, yeah, carefully picked by Caesar to protect them and carefully chosen to live in the palace. You didn't get to live in the palace because you were good looking. You get to live in the palace because you protected Caesar and you can take down anybody at any time. And Paul says, guess what has happened? It has become well known throughout Praetorian Guard and to everyone else why I'm here. Paul was chained to one, maybe one of them, maybe another type of guard, but he was chained to one of them 24-7, they cycle them in eight-hour shifts. So you think about the eight hours. He was always constantly around someone. Those guards, whoever they were, whether they were Praetorian guards or certain kind of guards, the Praetorian guards knew about Paul. They knew why he was there. They knew that he was a Roman citizen, but he had committed no crime. They knew that he was a minister of the gospel. They knew that he had been there for no crime at all. Why is he there? And you could imagine one of them, Paul, why are you here? And I said, because God sent his son to die in your place. Oh, I don't want to hear that, Paul. Well, we're not going anywhere. We're chained together for the next eight hours. You want to hear some more? They couldn't deal with Paul, so the next guy would come, right? And they, I bet they couldn't wait for the next one to come out. <laughs> say, okay, I'm done. You take over now. And they would have heard Paul's prayers. They would have heard Paul's writing as he's writing this and dictating it and talking and sharing. There's no way Paul would have reached them aside from being in prison. Think about that trial and difficulties that got to that that point where this Roman guard is able to hear the gospel, a thousand of them at a time, and they all knew why Paul was there. Oh, you got that guy again? Yeah, you know, I don't know why he's here. Honestly, all he has to do is say that he doesn't believe in it and he'll be free. You realize that Paul, that's all Paul had to do, that he, was, he would just have to deny Christ, say he didn't believe it, he was just making things up, and as a Roman citizen, he'll be free to go and live a good life for the rest of his life. But Paul said, for this reason, my chains and imprisonment is that I could preach the gospel, and therefore he's able to explain to these guards, all of them knew now, 9,000 of them, that the gospel of Jesus Christ was being preached to them and they would understand now why he's here. And this is an amazing thing. Think of this, and I thought about this. This is an acid test for Christians. Imagine an unbeliever being tied to you 24-7, or for eight hours. Think of it in a short version. Would you ever lead him to Christ if he heard and saw how you lived? He'd leave your sight. He was just always with you, or she was always with you, 
and watch how you live, watch how you talk, watch how you behaved, would he be convinced that you're a Christian? It's an acid test, really. That's what Paul endured. He was in that prison with these elite guards chained to him, and he had to explain the gospel to them, preach the gospel to them in a way that nobody ever could. And Paul says, look, this, this jail time, this prison time has turned out to be for the best. Don't pray for me to get out. <laughs> don't pray for me. You know, Lord, please release Paul from prison. Say, no, don't let me leave. There's still more people to be reached. And you go into some of these prison ministries, and that's how they think. The son of Sam, uh, Berkowitz, David Berkowitz, had a chance to be left on parole for a few times. He has become a Christian, so I know some believers that know him, upstate New York, and he actually denied parole for himself. He doesn't even want to get out. And they asked him why. They said, because there's a whole church here that I get to minister to. There's so many inmates and so many prisons, uh, prisoners that he shares the gospel with, he doesn't want to leave. Now, you can see his testimony online and things like that, but it's amazing. But that's how they think, and that's what Paul reminded of them. I don't want to leave. Look at verse 14. In that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord, because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Another thing that has happened. Paul is in prison in Rome. There's a church there. Church, the church of the Romans, the epistle to the Romans. They had heard that Paul was there. He knew that they knew he was in prison. So guess what happened to them? Read it again. They have taken courage to speak the word of God without fear. It actually, by Paul being in prison, it's ignited the brethren in the, in the church in, in, in Rome that they would go out and preach more without fear. When you read the letter to the Romans, this is not a test or anything like that, but there's one thing that Paul said to them. He says, I want to come and bestow a gift upon you. Bestow a gift upon you. And he prayed for them that God would gift them. And they had the gifts. You read the book of Romans, they had the spiritual gifts. But there's one thing Paul wanted to give to them or bestow upon them and pray that they would have it. And it's the most... It's a gift that is most accompanied with the filling of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. It's actually quoted more times than any other gift in the book of Acts. What is that gift that the Holy Spirit gives? Right? I'll give you the Greek word, see if you know it, not the test. It's called parasia. Parasia. What does that mean? Holy boldness. Holy boldness. Acts 4. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness, without fear, fearlessness, we would say. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the filling, the empowerment, the outflow, whatever you want to call it. It is boldness. And Paul says, I want to preach to, to Rome, and I want to pray for you that you would have a gift, Romans 1. I want to give a gift to you. What was that gift? Boldness, holy boldness. And guess what? Through Paul's imprisonment, they got it that the man in Rome, the preachers in Rome said, you know, Paul's in prison. Nobody's going to minister to us now. Well, we need to do it. Get over here, Mark. Get over here, Andre. Let's preach. And uh, since we're going to go to jail, you only have two weeks to preach, so it better be good, because then somebody else will be next in prison, right? And that's the way they thought. Actually, that's the way they think today. You go to a persecuted country. You go to a place where the persecution is terrible. They jail the pastor. Guess what happens? The church doesn't fold. What happens? Next man up begins to preach. And that guy knows that since the other guy went, he's next. So he better make his messages very precise and very clear and very good so the next one can come and take his place. And it goes on like that. That's the way they think. That's the way they behave. You know, here in America, you know, the, the, the pastor doesn't show up. Nobody shows up, right? It dies off. Why? Because we're so dependent on just an individual instead of the gift of teaching that God has for the church, the holy boldness that comes to some, no, to all that ask for that empowerment of the Spirit. They all pray, and they're all filled with the Spirit, and they all went out and preached the gospel with fearlessness. Pastor, I've never experienced that. Ask the Lord and he'll give it to you. Yeah, yeah. If any man ask, he will give. If anybody, you know, he who asks, receives. He who knocks, it's open. Oh, come on, it's not that simple. Yes, it is. 
And Paul says, look, through my imprisonment, they have got the holy boldness now. They go out and preach the gospel. Now, and this is some of the historical things, but this is, helps you. In 1555, so you'll never forget that date, 1555, 1555, the reign of terror in England began by Bloody Mary, right? Uh, Mary of Tudor, I believe that was her name. Uh, she was Bloody Mary. Everybody knows her as that. She was the Catholic queen who killed Christians. And through her reign, through her t reign of terror, they killed some Christians. The first one that died, the first one she imprisoned, John Rogers, uh, began to, uh, after he was tortured and he was put to death by, um, um, he was, it was burned at the stake, he ignited a fire and other Christian preachers. And there it began the lineage of great Christian preachers from Spurgeon to uh, Martin Lowe Jones, right? Of great men of God who preached the gospel. How did it come? Through persecution. Had it not happened, I don't know if we would have had that power, empowerment of the Spirit through this many preachers that came from that era, uh, from that era right? Nicholas Ridley, and on and on and on. People, men that knew what was at stake, and literally they would be on the stake not soon after that. But here's another one. John Bunyan was put in Bedford, Bedford Prison uh, for the name of the gospel, for the name of the Lord and the preaching of the gospel. Uh, by the church, by the way. They put him in prison there, so you could imagine that. But through that imprisonment, we have the greatest book besides the Bible, in my opinion. If you don't have a, has anyone not read Pilgrim's Progress that's willing to admit it? As many times as we have asked, okay, sell your shirt and go buy one, right? That is, a, it's a, the most amazing book, right? Yeah. <laughs> you have two shirts, so then you can do that. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we have, I got to talk to Amber if we have any more, but you got to read it. Pastor's recommendation beyond anything else. Read the Bible, read that book after. Right? Oh, pastor, I can't read. It's on audio now. Go to YouTube, and you can put Pilgrim's Progress, and put your headphone on, and just go for a jog. I don't jog. Well, just wash the dishes and listen to it. I don't wash dishes. Do something, and just, you know, just do something as you listen to it. Right? And then you can listen. You don't have to read it anymore. You can listen to it, and you'll be so encouraged by it. But this was written from prison. How? A man that was put in prison for 12 years gave us the most amazing encouragement. All to encourage you that the trials lead to great things. Difficult things lead to great things. And this is what Paul is saying. Through my experience here, I don't want you to pray for me to get out. I want you to pray for me that I have holy boldness. He's going he's to explain later on that he was concerned about something. Now let's talk about disappointments. Let's look at verse 15. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strive, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The other guys, the first guys, the guys with envy, uh, they do it out of selfish ambition. They preach, uh, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Here's one thing that caused Paul's disappointment. All right? Verses 15 through 18. Look at verse 18 now. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. In these four verses, the word preach comes up several times. Paul couldn't preach like he used to. He's in prison. And he's heard that people are now preaching the gospel more in Rome because of his imprisonment. That gave them a lot of courage or encouragement, but he also was disappointed that there were some people who took that opportunity to say, ah, oh, we don't like that guy, Paul. He's a, he's a thorn on our side. He's very popular. And this is what was happening. In the Church of Rome, Paul had come into Rome and been in prison, and Paul was a big deal. And the Church of Rome was not planted by Paul. They never met Paul, and so it was a big deal. We want to go see Paul. We want to hear more about Paul. And of course, this doesn't happen in ministry much, right? jealousies and envy and strife begins to happen. People want to teach. Who is Paul? I'm the pastor of this church. We're not going to let people go see Paul. And they began to preach their heart out now, thinking that by doing that, they would actually bring an irritation to Paul and make him less famous than he was already in Rome, thinking that by elevating themselves, it would make Paul jealous of them, and they would actually have the better position in the church, okay? So there were guys who were really preaching the gospel, 
and from Rome in a wonderful way because they took courage from Paul's imprisonment. Look at Paul. He's still preaching to the Praetorian guards. We need to go on the street to share the gospel. Amen. All right, go ahead. One. Good. All right. We need to go on the street and share the gospel. Let's go. And then some say, well, I don't like that. Everyone's talking about Paul. What about me? I, 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 I teach and I proclaim. And everybody's going to go see Paul and not me. Boo-hoo. So I'm going to preach harder and better than Paul. And I'm going to show him who's really the best teacher in Rome. And that's the way people approached it. And Paul knows about it. He knows their motives. Always examine your motives. What am I doing this for? Why am I preaching Christ? Right? Now, there's no jealousy and rivalry in ministry, right? That, that never does happen. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. There's, I'll spare you the details what happens behind the scenes. But there's just as much jealousy and strife. It looks like the world sometimes among pastors and teachers, you know, trying to say who's, you know, who's the big weight and who's the heavy weight and who's, you know, you know, get some elbow room and you know, this guy's got ten thousand people in his church. This guy's got five thousand. No, that guy's not that good. And you know, on and on, just just complete junk, complete crazy stuff. But Paul says, I know their motives. Their motives is to do it out of selfish ambition. They want to be the greatest. Paul knew this. He said they want to be great. Some do it out of love, knowing that I am, proclaimed, I am said to be a proclaimer of the gospel. But some out of selfish ambition, verse 17, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress. They think by doing that, they're actually going to cause me to be jealous. You know, this is where you know a true pastor and teacher. They're not bothered by it. Amen. They're not intimidated by it. Um, you know, Brother Jacob was just here. Um, you know, a lot of times he doesn't get invited because he knows so much. He just really, really very knowledgeable as a brother, as a Christian pastor. Uh, and other pastors don't invite him because they're jealous of what he knows. And they say, if he comes, then they're not going to listen to them. They're going to listen to Jacob. And so they don't bring him along. Because I don't know anything. He's welcome to come here anytime. <laughs> I'm not trying to hide anything. It's just the reality, Right. Uh, listen to what Jacob had to say on that Greek text. You know, he does it much better than I could ever do. There's no jealousy, there's no rivalry there, right? Amen. Why? Learn from Paul. Amen. Learn from what Paul is saying. Yes. One thing is concerning, he says. The one thing that I want to concern about is the preaching of the gospel. These guys, they're doing it out of crazy, selfish ambition, but you know what's being done? Christ is being preached. It's a beautiful thing. God's going to deal with their selfishness and their motives. But Christ is being preached. Do you realize what is happening? Out of their envy and jealousy, they think they're going to cost me distress. I don't care. As long as they preach the true gospel. As long as they preach the true gospel. Paul is not endorsing people that don't preach the true gospel, right? This is, one, this is a text that people use falsely to say, oh, see, that guy is a false teacher, but he's preaching the gospel. You just leave him alone. You know, Paul says, leave him alone. It doesn't say that. These guys are truly preaching the gospel. Um, there are people like, let's say, Jehovah's Witness, right? They don't preach the true gospel. It doesn't mean that, oh, at least Christ is being preached. I've had people tell me that. Well, the Mormons and the JWs, they're preaching Jesus. No, they're not. That's not even the gospel, right? It's a different gospel. Galatians 1, just read it. Uh, what Paul is referring to here is people that truly are preaching the gospel. They're doing it out of their selfish motives to promote themselves over Paul. Those guys, he says, they're preaching the gospel. I'm not irritated by it. But I know one thing, their motives are wrong, right? Their motives are wrong. It's out of envy and competition, right? The gospel does not depend on the preacher. Amen. The message of the gospel, the power of the gospel is not in the preacher, it's in the gospel. It's never in the preacher. It's never in the preacher. And people become so enamored with the preacher that, oh, if he said it, that's it. Over. It's going to work. No. Um, God has used donkeys. God has used kids. God has used many people to preach the gospel because the power is in the gospel, not the preacher. Didn't Paul say this in Corinthians? He says, it's through the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of preaching that people get saved. How is that? Because it is kind of foolish, isn't it, if you look at it from a world's perspective. A guy gets up here, maybe wearing this kind of shirt, and saying, and he's going to tell you and bore you to death for an hour and a half. 
or whatever it takes. And then people walk out and they forget everything they heard. Oh, pastor, don't waste your time. It's really foolishness. You should just go up there, tell some jokes, have some fireworks behind you, a lot of songs and smoke machines, and everybody's going to remember it. It's going to be short and nice. But Paul said it's through the preaching of the gospel. Why? Because the word that is being proclaimed, if it's the right word, if it's the right gospel, Amen. it's going to have an effect on people's hearts. Amen. Maybe Amen. not all of you, Hallelujah. maybe one of you. Right? Think of the sower and the seed, right? Yeah. Maybe the majority of you, maybe some of you. We don't know. But it's through the foolishness of this preaching that Paul said, it's how people get saved because the word of God enters your heart like a seed and it's planted and it grows, yeah. right? And it's watered and it gives fruit. Yeah. It's through the foolishness of preaching. So Paul says, I'm not concerned. I'm not, I'm not trying to elbow my way in there and being the best. They do it out of selfish ambition. God will deal with them. But I know this, Christ is being proclaimed. And I rejoice. Look at verse 18. And I rejoice in it. I rejoice in the fact that Christ is being proclaimed. I rejoice in the fact that this is being done, whether out of selfish ambition or out of true motive of the heart, it is fulfilling what God wants it to be done, the preaching of the gospel. The individual, God will deal with. We'll all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no doubt about that in my, in my life. I'll have to stand. You'll have to stand there. Makes you feel better. It scares me in a holy way that I need to do it the right way, that I need to do it God's way, and I need to do it the way he's told us to do it, right? Here's a man that's taking, uh, that, that is praising God, right? Not to take himself out of the situation. God, take me out of this mess! But he's saying, Lord, thank you that I'm in this circumstance. Thank you that I'm in it. Don't take me out of it, but I'm thanking you for the circumstances that I'm in today. No amen. We have a hard time with our circumstances we face today because right? it's disappointing. Paul faced disappointment. Look, these people are doing it out of selfish ambition, but you know what? Christ Jesus is being proclaimed. Christ Jesus is being honored. People are proclaiming the gospel. Do you know what? I don't want to ask the Lord to take me out of those situations. I'm going to thank the Lord for the situations that I'm in because he's sovereign in it. And as long as I'm not in sin and rebellion, wherever I am is where God wants me to be, no matter what, right? Now, if I'm in sin and rebellion, I need to repent and turn to him. But if that's not the case in my life, and it's where I am and the trials are facing, then it praise be to the Lord for the circumstances because it's advancing the gospel. You see, Paul, Paul's heart was about the gospel. It was about God's word being proclaimed. I want God's word to go out. Don't you? I want God's word. I, I don't... It doesn't matter if it was Jacob or Andre or Roy or Sergio here or whoever, just proclaim it, proclaim it, proclaim it, proclaim it. And, well, wouldn't you be, you know, you know, insecure about that and, you know, have another guy? I was like, it's the Christ Jesus is proclaiming. The message is the important thing, not the messenger. God deal with the messenger. <laughs> he will, but it's the message. Now, let's look at the next one. Talked about rejoice, but look at the uncertainty ahead. For I know this will in turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Through his prayers, through the prayers, I should say, of the Philippians, he was going to be delivered. There was something about Paul. He was confident that there was going to be a deliverance. But he didn't know which way he was going to be delivered. He was going to have a deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Right? And he's going to ask them to pray for something because here's the uncertainty ahead. We all have uncertainties, right? Financial uncertainties, health uncertainties. Our children, are they going to walk with the Lord? You know, our marriage, our situation, all these uncertainties. And Paul had an uncertainty. Am I going to get out? Am I going to stand before Caesar? Am I going to get killed before Caesar? Am I going to be, am I going to be able to share with Caesar, uh, in front of Caesar in this whole room of people, right? According to my earnest expectation and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but with that all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. This is what he's saying. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I need you to pray for me that I would have boldness, that I would have boldness that Christ will be exalted in my body, uh, whether I live or whether I die. 
Paul was going to stand before this Roman Senate and Caesar, and he's asking, Lord, I do not want to put you to shame. I don't want to discredit the gospel. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what I'm going to, am I going to be tempted to quiet and retreat back and, and shriek and fear? That has never happened to you, has it? <laughs> Many times. And the worst situation sometimes. Oh, come on, pastor. You're a pastor. I said, you know what? We need more prayer <laughs> because the temptation is even greater. Amen. I said, well, you, you're up there saying what, what many people couldn't say. I said, yeah, that's the boldness of the, of the Holy Spirit. That, that would be the, I would attribute it to the boldness of Christ. But here's one thing. Put yourself in a situation. Where is the situation where you would actually, not denied, but take it down, shriek back, put it down, bring it down a notch, right? Is it at your family's table, right? Is it, <laughs> right? Is it at your work environment? Is it at school? But we're all tempted to that. I have read pastors, this one unique pastor that went into a truck stop. He wasn't from the area, went to a truck stop, and he was going to eat, and he was going to share. I mean, he was going to eat and just pray for his meal. And you know what? The temptation was, I don't know if I could do it here. And he's like, why am I thinking like that? I've prayed before a lot of people. Why is this so hard today? Why is this so hard now? And, and, and he messaged one of his friends and says, I need prayer for boldness because I'm tempted to shrink back and not say anything. And maybe you felt like that before. Maybe in, you know, across the room from your best friend or across the table from your best friend or from your family or from your whoever it is. There's always that. Maybe it's just me. There's, this, there's that opportunity and we fear and we go, <gasps> And here's Paul. Paul never dealt with that, did he? Yes, he's just telling you right here. He's saying that I'm going to go before Caesar, and I need you to pray for me so that boldness may enter my life at the time and be able to exalt Christ. Now, whether I do it in my death or in my life, I don't know what's going to happen. That's the uncertainty, but I just want to glorify God. I just want to glorify God. Can you pray for that? And you know what? And this is why it's so important to share your prayers. How is this going to happen? Verse 19, through your prayers. My deliverance will come through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to pray for you guys and pray for me and pray for one another, that the provision of boldness through the Spirit of Christ may be upon you in those circumstances that you face that is going to be the most challenging one. He said, I'm going to go see my family this week. Brother, let's pray <laughs> that Jesus is going to, you know, I'm going to see... I, I don't know. I mean, you guys have different circumstances. That, my kids, right? Maybe my kids. I'm going to face my kids and I'm going to have to share with them. Or my grandkids or my, ah, that uncle or that aunt or that cousin, whatever, that friend, that person that I just can't get to share with all the time because I shriek in fear sometimes. And Paul says, I'm going to stand before Caesar and I'm praying that I exalt Christ in that moment because I could shrink back. I could shrink back in fear. Look at uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Just one, maybe a couple of pages over. Ephesians chapter 6. After he speaks of the armor of God, verse 19, he talks about prayer. And he says, pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Here's Paul. I mean, I can't even hold a candle to Paul. And he's asking for prayer, that he would have the boldness to tell people about Jesus in a way that it's the, the gospel, to make known the mystery of the gospel, because he's an ambassador, although in chains, that is proclaiming that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's a prayer. We all should write it down and have him handed it to one another. I said, would you pray this for me tonight, this week? Would you pray this for me this week? Would you pray for me this week? That boldness, I have to speak the way I ought to speak with boldness, I would be able to do it, right? Because I am an ambassador. Paul later went on to say in Corinthians that we're all ambassadors of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. But Paul especially, he was in chains. You're not in chains yet. Yeah. That was not a word of prophecy, but uh, you're not in chains right now. Maybe not yet. Maybe soon. I don't know. But there are brothers and sisters who are in chains, and they would hand you that prayer and say, that is my prayer today. I don't want deliverance from my trials. I want God's boldness in my life 
so that the gospel can be proclaimed. And you know what's going to happen? Man, we're going to have to hold you down every week because you'll be, you'll be sharing Christ and the boldness will just come out of your life. Let's get to this passage here because it's a beautiful passage. Looking at Paul regarding the future, verse 21 of Philippians. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now he's talking about whether I live or I die, I'm going to exalt Christ, but for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live in the flesh, in this body, this will be more fruit for you. Uh, sorry, fruit labor for me, and I don't know which one to choose. Right? Within weeks, he's going to face this trial. Within weeks. He doesn't know if they're going to behead him. He doesn't know if he's going to stand before Caesar. He doesn't know if he's going to be able to proclaim the gospel the right way. He doesn't know. And he's talking about his death, and it makes everybody scared. <sighs> right? Why? Because death asks a very important question in your life and in my life. And this is what was challenging today. The question about death is this. What are you living for today? That's what death is going to ask. Right? Death brings up this question. Right? People are afraid about talking about death. Why are you talking about death? <laughs> because death brings fear into people's hearts. Why? The idea is, what was your life about, and what do you live for, right? What is life all about, right? Amen. If it's about Christ, then you could say, man, my life is about Christ today. So if I die, it means more Christ, right? If Christ is for me today, being alive is Christ, then death actually increases Christ because I'm going to go be with him. Who wants more Christ? Who wants more Jesus? I do. Then we start all sign up for death. So you're morbid. No, that's what Paul is saying. He's talking about, look, in the question of death, death is actually something very liberating, Paul says, because I get to have more of Jesus because that's who he's living for. But if you live for money or wealth or possessions, Death is a very bad thing because you can lose everything and I get to take nothing with me. Oh, don't talk about it. I can't imagine losing that. Well, you're going to lose it anyway. The reality is, is is that what you live for? I'm taking it a step further. If you live for your family, oh, pastor, don't go there. That's, that's kind of sacred, is it? Especially on Mother's Day. Right? If you live for your family... If your family is the most important thing, then death is a negative again. Because when you know, what is going to happen to my kids? Oh, Pastor, isn't that a good thing? I said, yeah, it's a good thing. But the, my first reaction should be, I get to be with Christ. Yeah. I get to be with Christ. And then I could say, I'm my kids. Please take care of them. <laughs> right? If my reaction, if my family was the, the number one thing, then I would say, what's going to happen to my kids? Oh, no. Wait, Lord. Hold on. <laughs> You know, let's let, let figure this out, right? But Paul, so well, Paul didn't have any kids. He had thousands of kids. He had thousands of kids. He led many people to the Lord. He had all these children of faith, Timothy, Titus, right? Epaphroditus, Tychicus, all these guys were like Paul's kids. It's not like he was leaving them and saying, I don't care about it. you guys. don't have any kids anyway. He was saying, look, there's something so valuable in my life, and it's Christ Jesus, and I want to go be with him. And therefore, to live... This life is Christ. Now, the world would say, for me, to live is me, and to die is a great disaster. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's the world's way. To live is me, and if I die, oh boy, I'm going to lose everything. It's a great disaster. The Christian says, no, I'm living for Christ. If I get to have Christ now, and I die, I get to have Christ immensely, eternally. Who wouldn't want that? That's what Paul said. Who wouldn't want to be with Christ? Well, probably people that don't spend time with Christ wouldn't really want more Christ because they don't have much of Christ anyway now. It wouldn't matter one way or the other. But if you spend time with Christ and you know his character and you know his goodness and you love him and you know experience his love, you'd be like, who wouldn't want more of that? Paul is saying, I do. Because in this world, I have a temporary home. But when I get to be with Jesus, I'll have an eternal home. In this world, I have joy mixed with pain. When I get to be with Jesus, it's unspeakable joy, Peter says, an unexpressible joy. I can suffer here for a little, that's what Paul said, 
But with him, it's joy forevermore. It's a fight in this world. It's a fight. And it's a good fight. It's, I'm not denying it's a fight, but it's a good fight. When I get to be with him, it's a feast. Who wouldn't want that, right? And I am absent from the Lord right now. But if I go to be with him, I get to be with him eternally, right? Um, I live among sin, in the realm of sin. Not only my own flesh, but the world. With him, I get to be absent from sin, a void of, void of sin, and completely delivered from sin. Now, who does not want that? That's what Paul is explaining. I want to go there. However, there's something at stake here, he says, verse 22. Um, but if I live in this body, it means more fruit for my labor, but I'm hard to, understand, hard to choose which one I want. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, for it's very much better. And the Greek is very, very better. We don't say that, but in, in English we would have said very much better. It's very much better. Yet to remain in this body is more necessary for your sake. Literally, the word depart has this beautiful picture of somebody putting up a tent and taking it out. Okay, the tent is there and you've lived in this tent, and you lived in this tent, and you lived in this tent, and finally you said, oh, tent's up, let's go. Pull up your tent, let's go home, right? That's exactly what Paul is saying here when he says, depart and be with Christ. You live in this body, you live in this body, you live in this body, and one day said, the Lord says, hey, it's time to go, and you go, whoo, I'm out. That's exactly right. Now, verse 23 talks about being hard-pressed in both directions. See, he did not want to... He wanted to be with Christ, which is much better, but he also knew that he was there for one specific reason. And here is where, if you read a commentary, uh, I'll save you some time, Paul's writing gets really intense and passionate. He does not write in clear grammar, syntax, sentences, you know, periods and things. If you're a school teacher, Paul would drive you nuts because sometimes he would write in a way that didn't follow all the grammatical syntax rules that we have in our you know, proper English. And so some commentators try to fix Paul here and say, well, it should have been written like this. I know why he wrote it like that. If you've ever been passionate, you've been passionate about something, yeah. real passionate about something, and you just can't. I mean, you're, you're talking in like blurs, right? It's just a short sentence, and you go to the next point, you get to the next point, I would have failed grammar school very, very fast. But the point wasn't grammar. The point was passion. And this is Paul's passion, verse 23 to 26. I don't know which one to live, uh, which one to go. I want to be with Christ, which is much better. Yet being in this body is for your sake. I am convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, Right? Progress and joy in the faith. Fellowship is great, Paul says. I want to be with the Lord, but I want to stay here with you. What I choose, what I want to choose, I do not know. Thank God it wasn't Paul's decision. It was Christ's decision, right? And the Lord told them, Paul, you're staying. I'm sure Paul was a bit disappointed, but he says, they need you, Paul. They need you. Okay, Lord, I will continue. I can't see you yet. No, not yet. In a little bit, though, you'll see me. And Paul said, okay, I'm going to continue. But this is why he continues. Two things, progress and joy in the faith. What is progress? Advancing, discipling, growing in the Lord. Why do people lose their joy? They stop growing. They stop growing. Absolutely. You see Christians just completely bogged down. And they, you know, they, they even say this thing, I lost my joy. They don't know why. They think it's, you know, they didn't drink enough coffee or something that day. Or I don't know what it is. They, they're just trying to find an alternative. And you go, how are you doing in the Lord? Well, you know, I've been, been reading and been praying. I've been in church lately. I don't know where my Bible is. You know? Well, that's why. You haven't grown. You haven't continued your progress. No wonder you lost your joy. The devil didn't take it. You just stopped growing. That's what it was. Of course, the devil gets the blame right in a lot of times, and it does happen. But the reality is we stop progressing in the Lord. You lose your joy, right? The joy of my life is that Christ can do something with me today. Did you realize that today when you got up and you pray, Lord, do something with me today? And there's this expectation. What can the Lord do? What can he do? Anything. And if he decided to have this lump of clay do something, then he would be, Amen. you know, 
Maybe I question him. Amen. Amen. Question him, but he can decide. You know, I'm going to do something great in you today. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. You've been praying, and I'm going to go send you across to your enemy. You can share the gospel with them. Bring my cake. Love them. You know, whatever. Yes. Um, but that's what, that's what Paul did. Look, I'm going to, this is my concern for you, that you progress in the faith. You have joy and progress in the faith. Uh, Psalm 51. Did I have that one? Yeah, there it goes. Psalm 51. Remember the psalm? The, the repentance of David, right? And what did he say in Psalm 51? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He stopped growing. He went into sin and rebellion. And he stopped growing. He says, I have no joy. My bones weary. I'm, I'm just like dead in my bed. I cry all the time. I haven't been growing. I have no joy. And so he says, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. After he repented and started again back on the road with the Lord, right? Just like Pilgrim's Progress. Just like Pilgrim's Progress. I book again, right? Not advertising. I didn't write it. I get nothing out of it, right? Um, the progress of Christian, right? The progress of Pilgrim. It was evident that sometimes he did slide back. Sometimes he went off course. Sometimes he went off where the Lord didn't want him to go, whether it was, you know, the, the, the giant despair or the pool of the spawn and things like that. This was, the progress was stopped and he became dormant in his faith and he became not joy. There's no joy in it. But then he got back on the road and the Lord began to work on him again. So this is what happens to Christians, right? They stop walking with the Lord they slide back, and they lose their joy. And Paul says, I want to have progress, progress, growth that you will be completely trusting in him and growing in him. That's Paul's concern. He didn't even get to the end yet because in verse 27, and we'll pick that up next week, he begins to talk to them about their conduct, about their conduct, right? So from the next chapter, uh, verse 27, to about chapter 2, in the middle of chapter 2, he talks to them. What he's concerned about is their conduct, Amen. that you need to behave as Christians. Yeah. Can you imagine that? If Christians behave like Christians, what a world. It'll change society if Christians behave. And that was Paul's concern. Look, I told you about my difficulties. I want to bring my concerns about you. I want you to grow. And so that's Paul's concern, and that's next week. Ten times in this little passage, Paul mentioned the name Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. It's been said, if you ever lose sight of Jesus, go back and read Philippians. He's all over the page. And here's another example. Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus. It's all that matters, right? What does Christ think about my situation? That's what you need to ask yourself when you're facing a trial. What does Christ think of my situation? How is this going to honor Christ? How are these, how is my trial going to encourage God's people? You know, when you ask that question, that trial becomes very clear why you're in it. I'll give you that little bit of hint in, in my own life. When you ask the Lord, why am I in this trial? Lord, how is this honoring you? How is this going to help God's people? Then God reveals it to you. That's why I'm in here, right? It's so good to hear from the Lord like, like that, right? But when I ask, Lord, this, I don't deserve this trial, why me? Then you're never going to hear from the Lord because it's like, that's not what I put you in this trial for. It's to honor me, right? And then you get into your uncertainties. Lord, what's ahead for me? What's, what, what, I don't know what's going to happen with my son, my daughter, this job, this health. Ask the question again. Lord, just let Christ be honored Amen. through my life, whether by death or by life. I just want Christ to be honored. You know? And then you talk about your disappointments, you know, difficulties in your life, and you go, they're not disappointments. Because the gospel needed to go out, and where there was a setback in my own personal life, maybe the gospel went out more, and I need to see the Lord Jesus working through my life to get the gospel flowing forward in my life, out of my life, that Christ is exalted, the gospel is preached, and God's people are encouraged. That's our prayer today, right? Through trials, through disappointments, and through uncertainties, Jesus would be honored, the gospel would be preached, and God's people will be encouraged. And you know what? Paul had tremendous peace because of that. And that's why that verse in Isaiah 26 is all about. He will keep them in perfect peace whose mind stayed on thee because he trusted in me. 
How can you have perfect peace in trials and disappointments and uncertainties? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Get the gospel out and make sure God's people are being encouraged. No matter what you face in those three things, you'll have perfect peace. Paul's sitting in jail going, I'm actually enjoying this. People are getting saved here in jail. Rome is hearing the gospel all over the place. And the Philippians are growing. Lord, what? I mean, that's what my prayer's been. I didn't think about that it would be from jail. But who cares? <laughs> if Jesus is being honored, if the gospel is being preached, and God's people are being encouraged, man, put me in a hole right away. Because that's what I want. And I hope that's what you want. If you want to make me happy, if you want to make God's, forget me, if you want to make this fellowship really a joyful fellowship, do those three things. Honor the Lord, preach the gospel, and encourage God's people. My yeah. goodness, this will be a yeah. vibrant fellowship. Yeah. Do the opposite, and we'll have strife, anger, you know, jealousies, envy, strife. But if we do that, you'll be at peace. The perfect peace of the Lord. Doesn't Paul talk about that in Philippians 4? And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Again, Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, that we have this perfect peace that will come upon us if we trust you in our trials, in our disappointments, and in our uncertainties that the gospel of Jesus will go forth out of our lips and out of this church and out of the body here, that Christ Jesus will be honored in the way we live and behave and love one another, and that we'll be able to encourage others through the same encouragement we have received. Lord God, I praise you that you would do that. That's our prayer today, Lord God, that you give us more boldness as well, and you give us more courage in our faith, uh, Lord, we desire the joy of our salvation. We desire progress in our faith and restore, Lord, our joy. This we ask in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Sergio, do we have a song? Do we have a song? Let's respond.